Thank you, Siri, for a lovely talk. So now I'm very happy to introduce our discussant, who is Richard Kessler. He is currently the chief medical officer of an organization called Adults and Children with Learning and Developmental Disabilities. He's been teaching for a good number of years at the Institute for Psychoanalytic Education at NYU. He teaches a neuroscience integrative course there. And I know he's also been a regular participant in a neuroscience study group that meets at the American Psychoanalytic Association regular meetings. So he's been an active member of our community, and we're looking forward to hearing what he has to say about uh, Siri's presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm very pleased to have been invited as a discussant. I'm very pleased to discuss this work. Um, I mean, this, this is a multifaceted essay. It's uh, learned, it's rich, uh, it's wise. Uh, I think the, the comments that Siri made about her being a, a, an outsider are, are quite significant. I think um, uh, we see this with some outsiders, not all, but especially Siri, that, that they bring fresh insights, fresh appreciation of uh, psychoanalytic discoveries. And in particular, I think she has really hit upon some of those profound psychoanalytic discoveries and some of the most unique uh, aspects of psychoanalytic discovery. Uh, so this was a... Uh, Again, a, a rich and wise paper and, and a beautiful one. And I hope I don't rob it of some of its, <laughs> its aesthetic qualities uh, in, in my, in my uh, discussion. Uh, I'm going to start off with my, my having been inspired in a particular way by reading her paper. Uh, and that was because I was reading a novel at the time for my book club, um, which was The Red Badge of Courage. And um, I, I ended up rereading a particular passage inspired by her, her paper. Uh, I'm going to set this up and read it to you. This is, uh, this is a scene after Henry Fleming, our young hero, has deserted his regiment after the first taste of battle in the Civil War, the Battle of Chancellorville. And he is wandering around in the forest in the periphery of the battle that is still raging. And he looks upon a scene of columns of stout, strong Union soldiers rushing into battle. And this is what he says. Oh, this is the narration. He wondered what those men had eaten, that they could be in such haste to force their way to grim chances with death. As he watched, his envy grew until he thought that he wished to change lives with one of them. He would have liked to have used a tremendous force, he said, throwing off himself and become a better. Swift pictures of himself, apart yet in himself, came to him. A blue desperate figure leading lurid charges with one knee forward and a broken blade high. A blue determined figure standing before a crimson and steel assault, getting calmly killed on a high place before the eyes of all. He thought of the magnificent pathos of his dead body. <laughs> These thoughts uplifted him. He felt the quiver of war desire. In his ears, he heard the ring of victory. He knew the frenzy of a rapid, successful charge, the music of the trampling feet, the sharp voices, the clanking of arms of the column near him made him roar on the red wings of war. For a few moments, he was sublime. He thought he was about to start for the front. Indeed, he saw a picture of himself, dust-stained, haggard, panting, flying to the front at the proper moment to seize and throttle the dark, leering witch of calamity. And at this point, he feels his foot awkwardly poised on the ground and feels the, his empty hand, his hand empty of a rifle. And he suddenly... This, he, this bur bubble bursts, and he is despondent. Okay. A storyteller tells a story about a character, telling a story about others he is watching, and at the same time, about himself. I think this vignette captures some of what Siri has suggested about memory, 
perception, subjectivity, and creativity, so I would like to use it to amplify some of these subjects from a neuropsychoanalytic perspective. Firstly, regarding her criticisms, and criticisms of so-called self-processing research, surely there is no I without a you, but also vice versa, no you without an I. For example, what after all is the source of Henry's perception of the other soldiers, but his own shameful memory of his desertion? We're reminded of Freud's declaration in On Aphasia that, the per that perception and association cannot be separated because they are part of the same process. In this, Freud was declaring that knowledge in the brain and therefore the mind is intrinsically self-referential. Our experiences acquire meaning by virtue of the memories of previous experiences. Past and present are inextricably in intertwined. As Siri stated, what happens before becomes the template for what we expect to happen, a prediction. In the same spirit, Henry Head, the famous English neurologist, described brain activity as, this is a quotation, a march of events with a definite temporal relation. The response obtained from any one point at a particular moment depends on what has happened before, end quote. This relates to a simple conclusion most modern neuroscientists, from Kandel to Yinas, have reached, that brains, in fact, all nervous systems, evolve as predictors, as creators of, this is now my words, inner narratives of future events in order to safely navigate the environment. However, Henry's experience goes beyond simple narration. He hallucinates his masochistic fantasy. How do we understand how such a disturbance in reality testing can occur? Consonant with the notion of brains as predictors is the finding from a 2009 multi-site fMRI, stu fMRI study of schizophrenia that hallucinations are, quotes, anticipated sensory experiences, again referring to the future. Moreover, Siri asks questions about infant consciousness and memory. Let us recall that Freud postulated consciousness as initially experienced as hallucination as in dreaming and hallucinatory wish fulfillment. It is only over time and brain maturation that the objectivity of perception is learned, perceptions distinguished from memories, the past distinguished from the present, and the brain's predictions becoming more experience than wish-based. But does this hallucination slash consciousness model continue to operate in adult life? Is our perception of the external world a projection from memory of our internal world? In Totem and Taboo, Freud describes the external world as being largely built up by the projection of sense perceptions and internal perceptions of emotions and thought processes. Barry Apatow carries this further in his 1997 paper, The Real Unconscious, Psychoanalysis as the Theory of Consciousness. He describes the ever active hallucinatory wish as, quotation, the mind through purely internal operations generating an experienced reality. And what mentally is under consciousness, he asks, a striving towards hallucination dynamically intercepted and infused into the flow of awareness, penetrating and interweaving with consciousness to be partially realized in the external world. V.S. Ramachandran, whose Siri references in an essay, has stated, quote, in a sense, we are all hallucinating all the time. What we call normal vision is our selecting the hallucination that best fits reality. Rodolfo Yinas, who Siri also has referred to in one of her essays, concurs, the brain is a reality emulator, not a translator. It generates a continuous mental movie of the external environment. Quote, we are basically dreaming machines that construct virtual models of the real world. End quotes. So the brain is, in a way, an ever-present movie maker, storyteller. 
and see how this all, I think, resonates with, with so much of what Siri had mentioned, Siri's mentioned. Let's get back to Henry Fleming, our hero from uh, Red Badge of Courage. Note that it is sensory input that puts an end to his hallucinatory reverie, as if the outside world abruptly intrudes on his internal movie making. This feedback mechanism is the essence of reality testing, is what's out there, what I am projecting internally outside. This is how hallucinatory wish becomes thought, which Freud described as, quote, merely constituting a roundabout path to wish fulfillment, which has been made necessary by experience and therefore memory. Constructed from experience, the secondary process restrains the primary process. External reality constrains psychic reality. Again, Yinas would seem to agree. He sees sensory input from the environment as the modulator, the editor, so to speak, of the internally generated world, which he refers to as the content of the brain, as opposed to the context, which is the outside world. And he refers to this as private, closed, and subjective, which makes it intrinsically individual and idiosyncratic. This takes me to Siri's comments about creativity, which she correctly views as residing in not the so-called higher cognitive processes, but in, quote, dreamlike reconfigurations of an emotional meanings that take place unconsciously. Neuroscience would seem to have plenty to say about this. Let me first offer Pincus Noy's definition of the source of creativity, the primary processes. processes. They represent the organization of input, perception, storage, memory, according to basic drives, affective state, the sensory qualities of objects, the function of objects, and the self that is not subject to feedback, the flow of perceptual information that serves to regulate and monitor a given function. In other words, Henry Fleming, without the sensory information from his foot, and his hand. If this definition is valid, then dreaming must be the key to creativity. Dreaming is a state of the mind-brain wherein perception is dissociated from motility and external stimuli, making it an ideal state in which to develop imagery, thought, and imagination. Once again, back to Yi Nas. Dreams are cognitive states that are not modulated by sensory information. They are based totally on past experience. In dreams, we are released from the tyranny of sensory input. We can create possible worlds, future worlds. I'd like to offer a sampling of some recent neuroscientific findings on the topic of creativity. These are uh, quotations um, from just a sampling of, of some recent articles. Neuroimaging demonstrates that brain regions recruited for spontaneous creative thought. I have to mention the definitions um, of creativity are closer to this divergent, thinking. divergent thinking, thinking as yeah, opposed the to the, uh, the, yeah. the first <laughs> definition you gave. Um, so neuroimaging demonstrates that brain regions recruited for spontaneous creative thought overlap with those created uh, with those recruited during goal-directed thought, but they also compete with goal-directed thought. Uh, they share functions and mechanisms not only with other forms of thought, but in particular with sleep-related cognition. Spontaneous thought, also referred to as offline processing, recruits the default network, which we heard about from Siri. This is, this is the network where, in quotes, you're not doing anything. Okay, which is which consistent with fantasizing. Okay, the medial frontal cortex, anterior and posterior cingulate, precuneus, posterior parietal lobe, and memory processing in the temporal lobe. This so-called default network is activated when attentional demands diminish. The outside world is screened out. It is associated with the kind of memory consolidation, in quotes, that occurs during sleep. Its regions are more active prior to the presentation of remote associates problems that were sub subsequently solved by insight, and when creative stories are generated from lists of unrelated words. 
In addition, reductions in beta power, this is 15 to 25 hertz per second, which is correlated with diminished attentional processes, again, outside world, predicts transformative, insightful solutions. In, in, in one of the studies I read about that, um, scientists that were in the laboratory looking at the EEG, EEG were able to predict up to seven seconds before the subjects said that they solved the problem by looking at the, uh, the, the reduction in the, in the uh, beta power. And finally, REM sleep versus quiet rest or non-REM improves creativity by promoting the formation of new associations. <laughs> finally, I'd like to say something about theta waves, which last month, uh, Jak Panksepp said, were the most reliable biological marker of the seeking system. An article in Neuropsychoanalysis in 2007 entitled Waves of the Unconscious by Robin Carhart Harris described the neurophysiology of several dreamlike states in which hallucinations predominated, psychosis, psychedelic states, temporal lobe epilepsy, and temporal lobe stimulation. Like REM sleep, they are characterized by bursts of theta and slow wave activity in the medial temporal regions part of which he refers to as pontine geniculate occipital limbic bursts. He relates this neurophysiologic state to an upsurge of unconscious material into consciousness. Recall that Siri described writing the last pages of a novel in what she describes as a trance, dreamlike state. Besides REM sleep and other dreamlike states, theta is correlated with hypnagogic, hypnopompic states and states of sensory deprivation. All conditions, not coincidentally, with a diminished stream of information from the outside world, the context or the feedback. Theta, hippocampal and cortical, is first generated, however, during nursing, as demonstrated by Lentinen in a 2006 article on the nascent body ego. Subsequently, it appears in social contingency situations. These are all behavioral psychology terms. The behavioral concomitant to these EEG waves is described as internally directed, sustained, or controlled attention. Is this a correlate of hallucinatory wish fulfillment? Once theta has appeared during nursing, it can be generated during, for example, a peekaboo game. Bursts of theta can be detected not when the face is first seen or when it reappears, but when the baby is anticipating the return of the face. So presumably theta corresponds to the remembering, in parentheses, hallucinating, of the hidden face. But a more startling finding is that of Bazanova's 2007 work. His laboratory was able to detect a triad of physiologic responses in five-month-olds to the appearance of a smiling face, positive affect, a respiratory arrhythmia, and a burst of theta. Response initially to a blank face shows none of this, but invariably some signs of negative affect and a turning away. However, after repeated trials of blank face, the baby eventually develops the same response as it did originally to the smiling face. Positive affect, respiratory arrhythmia, and theta rhythm. Bazanova's paper suggests that prefrontal theta activation, the prefrontal is important because there's just something voluntary about this, uh, might represent internally controlled, sustained attention and an attempt at evoking reciprocity, that the face would smile back. Theta rhythm is said to be generated in hippocampal neocortical circuitry where information important to the species is to be gathered in the environment. In this case, an interactive mismatch potentiates mental development and maybe the earliest foundations of storytelling. That face made me feel bad. I remember, hallucinate, a face that made me feel good. Remembering, hallucinating, that face doesn't make me feel good. Will my smiling bring the smiling face back and make me feel good. I don't know if that's true, <laughs> but Siri's paper made me feel good and smile. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
go to questions from the audience, I just want to remind you guys again that next month we will not be meeting here. Instead, the Pfeffer Center is going to be hosting a day-long education workshop called Building a Psychodynamic Brain that I'll be the main uh, teacher at, and that's going to be held at NPAP. If you're interested, there's flyers downstairs. And also, you're all invited to an event that we're hosting co-sponsoring with the Swiss Consulate at the New York Academy of Medicine. That's Thursday, April 20, 21st in the evening. Uh, that's Pierre Magistretti and Francois Ansermet who are going to be speaking about neuronal plasticity and the dynamic unconscious. Okay, so now we can open the uh, floor up for questions. We, we don't have a roaming mic right now. We're waiting to upgrade the audiovisual <laughs> component of our auditorium. So please stand up uh, from the audience and I'll call on you guys. So, questions. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Right. And then just parts, they were not moving. Right, yeah. But I wonder uh, if, uh, first of all, you get a body schema if you have a body in parts, which is more recognizable to the person. And from my own experiences, if I try to recognize someone at a, at a distance, it looks like that person, and then I look to how the person is moving. Sure. If it moves like yeah. that person, I know it's, it's sure. a person. So I wonder uh, if you have the body and the parts, you can imagine the schema and the movement, and that uh, allows recognition. Well, this is, it's a fascinating thing. I mean, what we're talking about here is a form of self-recognition. And you know, from a phenom phenomenological point of view, it's an obvious fact that other people see more of us than we do. Huh? We are not outside ourselves. We are not viewers of ourselves. Um, and this, you know, this little study that Galese did, it's a, you know, it's basically matching. You know, it's not in that sense about motion. It's about two tasks. One where they discovered that the self-recognition without asking them explicitly whether it's their body part. They just were able to match their own feet and hands better than other people's. You know, it wasn't an explicit task. The second one. But there's no question that this knowledge, this proprioceptive reality, body schema, um, is a felt bodily reality as opposed to the other thing which is a body image, the ability that we have to recognize ourselves as an other in the mirror. And this is, I'm sure there are no Lacanians here, but you know that otherness um, is, that's the distinction that Gal Galazia is trying to get at. And I think, you know, since I've been in correspondence with him a bit now, that he is coming out of, a, uh, out of phenomenology. This is uh, very much the distinction. He wants to find out um, what the difference between body schema and body image is. And one is unconscious and the other is, is, is self-conscious. You know, the self as somebody else, the person in the mirror. Yes, please. Yes, well, you know, of course, the, you know, r romantic with a capital R is always something that we get nervous a about. I mean, I am a novelist, and, you know, I'm glad. So that uh, 
you know, I like writing fiction, so I suppose it's, you know, many people don't do that for a job, so I, you know, I'm not sure, you know, the same processes can create tremendous pain in people, right? These unconscious processes. Every psychoanalyst, everyone who's been in psychotherapy or psychoanalysis knows this. So I'm not trying to romanticize unconscious processes. The question of will is extremely interesting, I, and probably everybody here or many of you have read the Benjamin Libet studies, um, which show that something like a third of a second, a third to half of a second before someone decides to lift his or her finger, um, there's something called a readiness potential that, that an RP, so that, and Libet concluded, well, we are not, we have no free will, you know, this, go, goes way back to very um, old ideas, you know, man as machine. Um, my feeling is that, and, and, and this is really, you know, something that I haven't worked through in my own mind, but the idea that there's some moment of consciousness, and after that second, then we have will, I think is a rather false notion. You know, when you open the refrigerator to get it, you know, some water, you aren't fully conscious in this hyper way of, you know, your thirst that I'm going to the refrigerator, I'm opening the refrigerator. But no one would say that you're not willing to get the glass of water. So I think that it may be possible to theoretically re, you know, think what actually volition is. Um, and I'm not sure. I mean, it's, it's an open question. So, uh, behind you? Yeah. Oh, right, the memory business? Memory. Yeah, yeah. Right. And curiously, just trusting what you were talking about, how you would use a time and a place and a setting to develop your narrative and your creativity, that in that book, for improving the purposes of recall and, and uh, immediate memory, uh, he creates what is known as memory maven, help them, help, help the students create Yes, I do, because this is purely the old classical systems. It's Cicero. I mean, it's absolutely down the line. And, you know, that this should be some new memory technique, I find outrageous. Um, no, I mean, this is well known um, that in order to remember something, you can imagine a place. I mean, Cicero said it should be kind of spacious and ample, and you can plant words in one room after another. My father actually used this as, I mean, he would give a talk like this and he, he just memorized it, and he would do it by walking from one room to the next, uh, or according to the paragraphs. So um, this is an old, old memory technique. You, you can, have, it, it's mostly for memorizing yeah. things. This is not about, you know, what I'm really talking about is, you know, autobiographical memory. I think that space, and I don't really talk about it here, but I talk about it more in this book I wrote, The Shaking Woman or a History of My Nerves, which is that space is, I think, essential to memory. Um, memories cannot float in nowhere. They have to be located. And sometimes you create a fictional location if you have a memory floating. In addition, I think that, that illustrates the extraordinary significance of vision for human beings. Because you're, you're, atta you're attaching that sense modality to all of what you want to remember. I think that's extraordinarily helpful. Of course, there's always the caveat that you might be associating this memory with something 
uh, at, that would lead to you wanting to forget. But <laughs> 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 Yes, I, w I would fall into that. I mean, I'm, I'm radical enough to, to, to say that, that essentially what we're talking about are co-constructed co narratives um, that are emotionally true. I mean, this is my point. They're emotionally true. They resonate with analyst and patient, but they are not necessarily documents of some kind of historical reality. Was there a question in the front row here? No. So I'll go right here. And then Oh, can you can you just stand up and people can hear you better? Let me, let me, I'll just refer to this, something about what you said at the end. Um, just strictly uh, referring to what I do, the way I use noise uh, definition uh, as primary process without feedback. Now, one of the reasons I think that's important is because that clearly resonates with all various neuroscientists saying the same thing. Now, that's the difference between this default network that seems to be more associated with creative thinking and, and the uh, and the parts of the brain uh, uh, that are more uh, summoned up for use when we, we're trying to figure out a problem, we're doing a uh, you know, chug along kind of yeah. kind of solution. I mean, and the best clinical example, it's not a clinical, everyday example is when you're trying to remember something that's on the tip of your tongue. It's only when you stop paying attention to it that you're allowing the default network to sort of process it. And then, some, and then suddenly someone will say shoelaces, and you say, oh, that's right. That's, Rubber Soul. That was the name of the Beatles album. That, that's, that's, how it, that's how it happens. Uh, so I think the feedback thing is where it links up. Um, 
all of those neuroscientists, including um, the book that I got a lot of the sources of the experiments on creativity, never mentioned, no, they never mentioned psychoanalysis, never mentioned any of the things that we're talking about, which is, which is, um, which is unfortunate. And that's why both of us, we kept on referring to certain definitions and ways of speaking about things that had this very behavioral kind of, uh, you know, orientation that didn't seem to actually capture enough <laughs> of what we want in those definitions. So there's, there's really no, in that area, I think there's very little interchange, unfortunately, with psychoanalysis. Yes, yes. So I'm, I'm going to call on myself, and then I'll call on you. Um, so I think one of the central things that's important about what you guys were both discussing, and, and one of the central points of your paper, series is that from a perceptual point of view, in terms of what the mental image is, regardless of if you're having a memory, a fantasy, a projection of the future, or a current perception, that the image making, as Damasio would say, is, is very similar across those. Yes, but then there's a feeling component that may be associated with an awareness of time that allows us to distinguish between, this is what I'm perceiving now, and this is what I realize I'm remembering from, the, from before. And Damasio would say that part of what allows us to distinguish between current perception and memory is that when you're having a current perception, the image of what I'm seeing is linked up with the feeling of my eyes moving around, for example, what he would call the portal of sensory information. And if I'm having a memory that's not related to what I'm currently perceiving, I'm not going to have those same sensory proprioceptive cues at the same time. So that's a, a key distinction. And then from a psychoanalytic point of view, which is one of your thrusts as well, is that in the mind, unconsciously, presumably memories and fantasies are having very similar affective impacts on us as, as actual perceptions. Yes. And in the process of psychoanalysis, for example, that's one of the things that we're doing. We're trying to create a conscious space for making a distinction between, oh, this is what I'm fantasizing and this is what I'm keeping myself from being aware of and so on. So I think that there's an, a very important role for creating that consciousness in an analytic process to make a distinction between, because one of the implications, I think, of what you were saying is that if I'm going along in the world and not doing something because an internal representation says, if I do X, my mother's going to look at me with disgust. If I don't create a space for comparing whether that's really happening or not, my unconscious mind thinks that it's really happening. But if I can create consciousness and compare what's going on with what I think is going on, I think that's one of the roots of, of change. It's creating, it's sort of like a workspace for comparing realities. No, no, th I think this is really important. You know, Merleau-Ponty says another thing. He says, nobody, you know, unless you're mad, mistakes the here and now for a memory or an imaginative projection. We know the difference. And that's what Damasio is saying as well. What I am arguing is that what happens in episodic conscious memories and in imaginative projections, either me in the future or somebody else, a completely fictional story um, that has deep emotional resonance, that the um, mental gymnastics <laughs> are the same. But the here and now is something quite different. That is, as you say, we are getting feedback. And in relation to dreaming that you mentioned, of course, dreaming and creativity and fiction have long been, um, been connected. But it's, it's also this retreat from the immediate sensory, visio-sensory world into um, another world. And it also requ uh, requires, I think similarly, a state of relaxation. Mm. I mean, as a poet, you know, I'm sure you feel this. I mean, that you, you know, tension is the enemy of art. Well, you know, dancing is what it's called, being in the zone. In the zone, that's right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, Thank you. 
suitcase for Lady Banshee. Nobody knows what's in it. That's what crystallizes the whole narrative, the, the, the presence of the need to explain the ending. Now, an individual, I think, whether they're in a creative trance state or trying to figure out whether they're going to start a company or not or whether they're going to buy a book or not, go through a bit of a narrative that has to be crystallized by some ending by, of something. And to some degree, there's the issue of aesthetic choices that you make along the way. And some of these are informed by memory. And some of them are actually informed by experimentation. Because sometimes people try out ideas. Oh. Oh, but, but you know, I, I really want to emphasize, emphasize this. Of course, you know, and also, people work in different ways, you know, and filmmaking is a collaborative art. It's really a different way of proceeding from, say, sitting alone in a room and writing a novel or a poem. It is something else because you're working with so many people, even if someone like Hitchcock, who has a very specific vision, storyboards, the MacGuffin, all of that. I'm trying to talk about making art, you know, at a pretty, I guess what neuroscientists would call a pretty low level. I mean, what I'm saying is why one story and not another? This is really important. This is not a joke. I mean, the Cohen brothers can say, oh, well, we figure out the ending, but why that story? Why any story? Theoretically, one is completely free. What I am saying is that the constrictions on the story are essentially emotional, dreamlike, a fabula that in some strange way pre-exists. It's in the human being before the work of art even comes out. Because how do I know when I write something and I go, that's it, that's right. How the hell do I know? Because it's emotionally resonant for me, that's why. Sorry, I just, Fred, we just want to make sure people get a chance to speak. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, let me just take some more questions from the back. Thanks. Can you stand up so we can hear you? Thanks. Hi, Maria. <laughs> Right. Yes, well, that this is, you know, what people are trying to, to tease apart in some way. But I, I think, listen, you could do a whole lecture on, you know, how do I edit my sentences? You know, that's on another level, right? Um, you know, not, not too many adjectives, the sounds, you know, strong verbs not too many gerunds. You know, you know, you could do this, but that's a kind of technical, crafty, artsy craftsy. But that's not the 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 bottom impulse that is propelling a story out of you. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm.
Yeah, no, I, I mean, you know, there, I'm sure you know this, this well, but I mean, there are theories that um, possibly these moments of great creativity, particularly in poets, there are a lot of poets who um, have had some form of manic depression or bipolar, and there are, there is speculation that there's a bilateralization of both hemispheres in language use, you know, that is at work. Um, so I think this is, you know, something to, to research, yeah. Yes, yes. So it's an emergence of a new sense of self from the right side uh, or in combination uh, coming in sync with the neurotic type. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, listen, we all know, you know, this uh, Anna Freud's uh, phrase about intellectualization, you know, that, that people on one side or the other of therapy have understood how you spin out some kind of story, which is very much like a confabulation, um, which you think is hoping to explain something, and then you realize that you're really just dancing on these sentences that are not emotionally grounded in the way that you're seeking in a, you know, for a therapeutic moment those two have to come together, or you're just confabulating. Excuse me, just to answer something about the right brain. Um, all, all of the uh, early uh, inter interactional processes, the, 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 the time when the mind is being created and co-created between uh, between infant and caretaker, there's a bias towards right hemisphere during those during those years. Um, all the the, um, uh, the the state of rhythm experiments, the recognition, early recognition of mother, recognition of face, all those things are biased towards right hemisphere until uh, the dominance of the left hemisphere with language starts to take over, and then you can't see those, those differences. But in the er very early years of life. This is all right hemisphere bias. And also those beautiful things about, um, I mean, he, this goes back to Hewlings Jackson. He talked about, you know, right, the right hemisphere um, coding emotional words um, and music, you know, lullabies, all of that. I mean, this is, it's, it's an old idea that's being borne out all the time now. It's fascinating in relation to poetry and music. So we'll take one more around the aisle and then we'll move over to this side of the room. You know, the last lecture, Jak Panksepp was here, and he said something that really hit me very profoundly, which is that, you know, I, I quote him here, but I mean, he's talking about, you know, the, the proto-self or the, this very old self networks, you know, reptilian part, part of the brain. But he said, you know, the, 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 the cortex or the frontal cortex is like blank slate. I mean, it w really hit me. I go, wow. Um, and I think one of the things that with the, the visual cortex, one thing we know is, is um, how dynamic it is and that if you're uh, blind, you lose your sight, then that the whole uh, visual cortex is given over to other functions, other sensory functions. Um, and, you know, m my, and this is kind of a, a gut sense, I mean, I think one could make an argument, certainly make an argument meant for it. I think the nature of the human brain mind is that it has meaning. 
And I think that traumatic experience is that the organism absolutely cannot digest nonsense. So I think that that kind of emotional meaning is necessary for us to interpret experience anything. Well, um, I mean, that, uh, what we just said goes along with something I was going to say about the mirror neurons is that um, th that the, the, the actions that of another that um, seem to generate activity in mirror neurons has to be purposeful. Yeah. It has to be purposeful movement yeah. and in fact uh, it can be demonstrated that and this is separate from that, that, that work that the um, that the uh, that people are looking imperceptibly at the end of an action while they're watching the initiation of an action. Yeah. So, 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 the, so the, the attention of the visual system is to a complete meaningful act. Okay? Right. And, and I just want to emphasize again about vision, how important vision is. Um, I, I do work with, with autism and there's a lot in the literature about some of the earliest signs of autism. You see that all the time. And, and mutual gaze is a very, yeah. a very important one that's been replicated many times. And one of the things that makes mutual gaze so important in human beings is because our eyes are different than all non-human primates because of the white sclera, which has been demonstrated to multiply and, and factorially the ability to gaze with another and to, to know what they're looking at. So and there, are, there are many aspects of vision that are very, very special and crucial to, to mental development in human beings. Okay, question over here. Who quoted Einstein? Juan <laughs> <laughs> Carré. <laughs> okay, go for the other part. Go for the other part. Right. Out of, out of another world, but something in our world. That that, as a, you mean as an idea that penetrates. Not an idea, but an actualization. That the modern world is a world where freedom is quote unquote actualized. It's not a world where the free is, you know, some, freedom exists in some other sphere. But, you know, the norm is freedom. One is expected to make free choice. Right. 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 Well, it's it's yeah, it's the free will question again in some sense. I mean, I think um, creativity. Winnicott is really wonderful about playing and creativity and the fact that this relates to all of human experience, and it's you know it's part of the sciences, it's part of the humanities, it's part of you know. Uh, people uh, making food. I mean, creativity is not some limited idea. You know, I happen to write novels, but I recognize deeply that creativity is a, has a huge sphere. And I think Winnicott is right. I didn't talk about playing here, but that play is a very deep concept when it comes to creativity. And as he says, some people have to learn how to play. And, and, you know, the idea of freedom, oh, my God, you want to talk about? <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, there, I, 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 I'm not sure um, that, you know, if we construct a, an idea of the psyche and the embodied psyche as I see it, that we really are creatures of absolute freedom. Um, no. I'm saying, I'm saying it as a standpoint of a culture, of a world. 
Right. Which I think is different. And I think it's important to make the distinction. I think one pervades the other, but I think the Are you saying that, it, that, that, that this is a concept that is alive in our culture, absolute freedom, or you're saying that it actually exists? I think, well, I mean, it's embodied in the Constitution. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean it's, it's not, it's not free that. I mean, it's Im it's embodied in law also. People are people are, but but, but that doesn't mean an individual no. person has that has the freedom from a neuroscientist point of view. And in fact, it, it, it's strange that the word will, because it's connected to free will, is sort of floating out there, separate from all kinds of other words, which in a way mean the same thing. Um, but we've already we've already uh, understood that those things exist unconsciously, even though we usually refer to them as conscious. In other words, if you say to somebody, did somebody do this on purpose, intentionally, and so on, and then we sort of understand that you can do things that are on purpose and intentional, that are unconscious, even though we, in, 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 right. in well, usual thought, but that. so somehow, but will falls in that same category of, of, of word, of, na of, of verb, uh, but it somehow has remained mysteriously out, outside of, that collection of words because it's connection. I think there's something theological maybe. Okay. So we're just gonna, okay. well, sorry, I mean, we need to wrap up soon, yes. but yeah, go ahead, sir. Do you no, I, my sister and I used to say accidentally on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, we just have a couple more questions. You if, made a, a point about uh, the brain, the mind, uh, and its activity about meaning. You yes. added the part about the uh, mirroring happening when there is actually paying attention to what happens at the end, the sequence. Uh, in a way, what I'm getting from that is that um, that activity of creativity, of making sense of things, is like closing the eyes and connecting the dots. And mm -hmm. letting, so that it's almost a physical, it's not something that we consider a top-down phenomenon. No. A very basic instinct to connect the dots. I, I comp that's exactly, that's a beautiful little summary, I think, of the motion of the paper, which is exactly that. I'm really arguing against this notion of, um, well, especially fiction writing as some kind of top-down, um, uh, you know, unemotional, unemotional sort of planned behavior, yeah. Absolutely, and that it's temporal, and that's part of the connecting of the dots. Yeah. So we'll just take two more questions. I saw the last two hands, so mm -hmm. please. Well, it's about seeing and um, seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and seeing and So, the, I, yeah, you mean the, so just so uh, if yeah. people didn't hear that, the question is, you know, what would Siri say about making a distinction between hallucinations that are caused by drugs <laughs> and other kind of hallucinations? Yeah, I think just to describe one, which is for people, um, yeah. No, no. No, I think we're talking about two different kinds of hallucinations, actually. I mean, th he's using it in that very classical Freudian sense when he talks about the baby mm -hmm. having some kind of image or whatever. It's a kind of, it's a, you know, that, and he wants, you know, we have this all over psychoanalysis, you know, the hallucination of the breast, for example. Um, what you're talking about is something I've had to, both auditory and visual hallucinations. The, my only visual was these two little, a little pink um, man with this little pink ox. 
And I had exactly that feeling of they're so adorable. They're so sweet and nice. And I actually didn't think they were unreal or real. They were just there. And then with auditory hallucinations, um, often before I'm going to sleep, which is quite common, I hear voices, both you know, men and women. Um, so I think, <laughs> I think we're talking about two different well, uses, I'm, aren't I'm, you? I'm, I'm not sure. Actually. Yeah. Um, first of all, the, the, everything that we would say about visual hallucinations, neurophysiologically, is true for auditory hallucinations. They are anticipated perceptual experiences. Okay. And when you say you don't know where the wish, well, first of all, some of what you described are illusions and not hallucinations. Okay, the distortions, of, right? Okay, but okay. Um, uh, but when you say where's the wish, well, when somebody presents a dream, where's the wish? I mean, if somebody has a delusion, where's the wish? So I, I you know, we don't know. I, I, I still suspect that there is a wish somewhere, as <laughs> a, 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 there are wishes everywhere. I, to me, I, they're still the foundation of all mental experience. So, so I don't know where the wish is. I wouldn't. It, it, might, it, it might take a few, a few months to find out where the wish is. So we'll just take one last question in the back. Yeah, said, there's yeah. a study, and the lab is in, uh, is in Russian. It's almost all the articles are in Russian. Uh, but I have one that's in English. If you email me, I'll give you, give you the reference, okay? Okay. So I want to thank again Siri Husvet for a great talk and Richard Kessler for a great discussion. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Okay, see so you guys.